Hello and welcome everybody to the Leron Lickman show, the show that touches on the human component in global business and marketing. And today I'm very excited to have Matt Abrams with me. Hi, Matt. How are you? I am great. Happy to be here. Happy to have you. It's morning in uh, San Francisco right now, where you're based. It's uh, evening time in Tel Aviv, and this is totally global world and global conversation. So I'm really excited um, that you are spending this morning with us. Um, we will are actually going to discuss a very important po topic that, in my view, is not really much talked about, which is about anxiety and specifically anxiety and communication about, among growing startups. So mm -hmm. this is something that you're specializing in. And, That's uh, true, absolutely. And, and we need to pay more attention to it because it is something that bothers many, many people. Definitely, and definitely now after COVID and so on. So uh, before we dive into the questions, and I can't wait to hear all the smarts that you have to share with us today, I just want to make sure everybody uh, knows a bit more about you. So. Um, Matt Abrams uh, is a lecturer in organizational behavior at Stanford University's Graduate School of Business, where you teach two very popular classes in strategic communication and effective virtual presenting. Um, you're the host of the Think Fast, Talk Smart podcast, check it out, and the author of the book, Speaking Up Without Freaking Out. We're going to talk more about it soon. Um, I will share as well that um, you hold senior you hold senior leadership positions in several leading software companies, uh, where you created and ran global learning and development organizations, and the founder and principal of uh, TFTS Communication LLC, a presentation and communication skills company based in the Silicon Valley, and many many more amazing things. But I'm sure you'll get to to see it for yourself during this session. So um, without further ado, today we're going to talk about different topics um, around, as I said, the communication and anxiety around startup founders, um, communication in different cultures, about video and the new you know, hybrid world, and even about communication and improving in within the startup. But I would like to start with kind of your journey, Matt, because you mm -hmm. have been working for software companies and you have been working in the, the tech part of things and also living in Silicon Valley. What made you uh, move um, in, in the way you did from the software world to teaching communication to Fortune by 100 companies and students, of course? Yes. So I, uh, after graduate school, where I studied communication, I went to work. Uh, needed to pay off some loans and wanted to see how what I learned could be helpful in the in the real world, not the academic world. And it became abundantly clear over my decade plus working in, in the software industry that communication skills are absolutely critical for success, not only within an organization, but between organizations and customers, prospects, partners. Communication is critical. And I often saw that not necessarily the brightest person with the best ideas was the person who was successful. Rather, it was the person who could communicate their ideas in a compelling and confident, engaging way. And that just became very, very interesting to me. And given my academic background in graduate school, I knew that there was more that could be done to help people. So I transitioned from high tech and came back to academics and, and really have been studying and coaching and teaching people for now almost three decades to help people feel better and more confident in their communication so that they can be more successful. Yeah, I really like what you said because I think even um, research shows that it's not only the best employee or that you can be as talented as, as can be, but your communication is the extra mile that can really makes a difference for one's career or any goal achievement. Absolutely. Communication is critical in everything we do in work and in our personal yeah. lives. And, and we need to spend time thinking about how we can hone and develop the skills. Yeah. And I like that you say personal life because we, we, we communicate all the time, but do we really know how to communicate? Well, I think that's. Well, I've been told by my kids and my <laughs> wife that I still have a lot to learn. So I, I'm still working <laughs> on it myself. We all do. We all do. So, you know, when it comes to to uh, anxiety, I think, you know, generally speaking, and I can tell you about myself being a very, very social person, the COVID and, you know, being more at home, I think, you know, I needed to 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 get back on the horses, they say, let yes. alone people that most people experience anxiety, right? Like you mentioned about 85%. Yes. Yeah. I want to 
ask you, first of all, is anxiety in such circumstances when you're building your company, is it good or bad? So, you know, anxiety is one of those things that can be very helpful, but it has to be managed appropriately. Anxiety is something that gives us energy. It helps us focus. It reminds us that what we're doing is important, but we have to manage it so it doesn't manage us. And part of this is how we frame it, how we see it. If you see the anxiety that you feel is something that's empowering and exciting, that can be really helpful. But if you see it as daunting and something that, that is burdensome, then it can actually work against you. And again, it all comes down to my point of view to managing that anxiety. And I've spent a lot of my life in my teaching, my written work, my coaching, helping people learn techniques to help them manage the anxiety. So I think before we manage, what, how does it feel like, you know, what, how do I know that I'm experiencing an anxiety? Right. So there are many how, things. That go, and then how yeah, to there, manage. Many, there are many people who, many symptoms and signs that, that people have anxiety. Uh, the, the things happen to us physiologically, things happen to us cognitively, mentally, that get in the way of us being at our best, helping us focus, etc. So physiologically, people often feel their heart pounding. They feel themselves breathing quickly. Some people begin yeah. to shake from the adrenaline rush they get. Often people can get dry mouth. Uh, what, I, what happens to me is I perspire and blush when I get nervous. So those are the physiological symptoms. And then there are the psychological symptoms. Uh, these include things like forgetting what you want to say or feeling bad about yourself, saying negative things about yourself, doubting what you can do. All of those are symptoms of anxiety and all of them can be managed uh, if you spend the time to do that. Yeah. So, and if you can give us some tips on how to manage that. So I, what you said, I, I've definitely experienced many times in my life as well. Um, and it's like pushing us back from doing what we need to do. So what would be your tip to managing that? So there are lots of tips and, and I'm hoping you'll share some information when we're done to, to point people to where they can learn much more about this. Yeah. But at the highest level, there are two approaches you have to take to managing anxiety. One is dealing with those symptoms I just described and then also dealing with sources. Sources are the things that initiate and exacerbate our anxiety. So let me give you a few examples of, of these. So when it comes to symptomatic relief, the first and best thing we can all do is to take some deep belly breaths. If you've ever done yoga or Tai Chi or Qigong, it's the deep belly breaths. And what's most important is not the inhalation, it's the exhalation. So you want to take slow breaths in and just make sure that your exhale is twice as long as your inhale. So if you take a three count in, take a six count out. This will slow down your autonomic nervous system, will regulate your breathing, slow your heart rate. So deep breaths are the number one thing to do, but there's several other things you can do as well. If you get to be shaky, somebody who shakes a lot, doing big, broad gestures when you start can be very helpful. You, by engaging big muscles and moving them, you will let that adrenaline dissipate and the shaking stops. If you have dry mouth, drinking some warm water or sucking on a lozenge or chewing some gum before you speak, absolutely can help reactivate those salivary glands. If you're like me and you perspire and you turn red when you speak, that's because your core body temperature is going up. And a great way to manage that is simply to hold a cold bottle of water or a cold drink in the palm of your hand. It reduces your body temperature, just like putting a cold compress on your forehead or the back of your neck. So those yeah. are things we can do to manage symptoms. In terms mm -hmm. of sources, let me share one. Many of us are made nervous because of a potential negative future outcome. Whenever we communicate, we have a goal. And what makes us nervous is not achieving that goal. So for entrepreneurs who are just starting their business, they want to get funding and support and they're afraid they yeah. won't. The students I teach are afraid they're gonna get a bad grade. These are our worries about the future. And that's what initiates and makes our anxiety worse. So if you can counteract worries about the future, by becoming present oriented, by definition, you won't be as nervous. So how do you get present oriented? A couple things you can do. Do something physical. Walk around your building. Do some jumping jacks, something that gets you in your body. Do what we did before we started uh, this recording. You and I had a bit of chit chat. We talked a little bit. That's a great way yeah, to connect and be present. Right. 
Great mm-hmm. way to be present oriented. Do like athletes do. Athletes listen to songs or playlists before they do their sport. So this is just one source of anxiety. There are many others, but there are things you can do to manage both your symptoms and sources to help you feel more confident. So I have to say that I love it. I've never heard this type of approach to, to that. And as you said, first of all, with, with, the, with the physical body and breathe, like these are things that are so simple for us to do, just to take a moment, go to the corner, breathe well, and also, I really liked what you said about um, the anxiety that it won't work. And I know for me also being an achiever and, and you know, if, if I will approach you and you will reject me and if I will not get this funding and, and that's very, very stressful. And I liked how you pushed it back into being the present moment. Don't focus on the noises. Um, that's, these are really important tips. So. Excellent. Thanks so much for sharing. Now, I want to let's take it another level up. OK cultural difference problems. So let me share with you. Now, I know we talked before that you have some Israeli friends. I'm sure there, there are many of those in the Silicon Valley and obviously in the business world. I know a lot of a lot of um, entrepreneurs that have never been in such strong engagement with the Americans or other markets. Um, and many of them have the kind of perception that they, they speak English, they're fine. You know, we, we have a lot of songs and TV shows and movies and so on. So we know how to do business in America. So my question to you would be, um, what would be the tip for communication in uncertainty, meaning when me as a startup founder, I know there is a cultural gap, but I don't know where it is. I don't know how to spot it. Therefore, I don't know what should I do differently. So how could I communicate in such circumstances? So culture is, is a really important issue to consider in communication and not just across countries of origin and, and experiences uh, of where you grew up, but different organizations have different mm-hmm. cultures and within an organization, you can have different cultures. So it is very important to reflect on the importance of culture. So of course there's work you can do in advance. It's important to do some research, not just on the culture you're going to, but the people you're meeting with and understand what's important to them. Searching, you know, I call it cyber stalking, look at their LinkedIn profiles, look at their company bios. If you're talking to investors, look at the other companies they've invested in. It gives you insight into what's important for them. And that's really important for you to know. Additionally, when you're in interactions or entering into interactions with people from different cultures, again, it could be different countries, different companies, be a, be a very astute observer of what's going on. The temptation, especially when nervous, is to, is to just move forward and, and start. But sometimes listening and observing really important and a great tool to help is much like you're doing today is to ask questions so get people talking about themselves get people sharing what's important to them that gives you insight so it's important to to give yourself that space allow yourself to listen and observe and and ask questions so you can get more input again the temptation especially from some particular cultures is to just start right away. The best way to show I'm confident is to initiate right away. And that could be true in some circumstances, but often observing and listening are really, really important. Thank you so much. And when it comes to pitching to investors or clients, as you said, there is much anxiety, much pressure. We want to close this deal or move forward. Do you have any structure to ensure the clarity of message, no matter, again, where you're from or what culture? Yes, I, I think every entrepreneur, I think anybody with an idea, it doesn't even mean need to be an entrepreneur, needs to be able to pitch it very quickly and efficiently. I have a structure that I like to use to help people do a very quick pick, pitch. And the structure not only helps others understand what you do, but it helps you focus your pitch. So it's answering four quick questions. The first is, or their statements more than questions. The first is, what if you could, what if you could finish that, finish that sentence? So that, for example, and that's not all. So let me give you a pitch that I might give a client or a prospect who's interested in my consulting services where I help people with communication. So it sounds something like this. What if you could be more confident and compelling in your communication? so that the next time you run a meeting or give a pitch, you feel good about it. For mm-hmm. example, imagine if you are pitching to VCs and you want to get funding, wouldn't it be great to go in knowing you're confident and your pitch will land? 
And that's not all. Mm -hmm. These skills will help you beyond pitching. They'll help you in your interpersonal life and in your organizational life as well. So by using those four prompts, what if you could, mm -hmm. so that, for example, and that's not all, helps you really focus your pitch. And it has the added benefit of making sure that you're fixated on the relevance and value that you bring to your audience. Too often, entrepreneurs focus on what their product does and the features of the mm -hmm. product rather than the value that the product or service offers to the prospect, the investor, the customer. So this structure really helps people focus so that they can deliver a better, more succinct pitch. I love it. As you said, it puts you in the right frame, focus you, and also, as you said, also addresses what matters to the other side, the value that the other side gets, your differentiating point. So thank you for sharing this. Yes. Now, after we, we came in, you know, we, we, we were clear enough. There is also in, in our pitch, then, you know, there is the process of selling or of investing of, you know, back and forth meetings. And uh, apart from being, you know, consistent with your messaging, there is also a component of, I would say, influence. Maybe persuasion is not the right word, but maybe influence would be the word. What would be the influential uh, component they can add to their pitch? So persuasion is really important and thinking about how you can influence people. Uh, it boils down fundamentally to, to one key concept, which is know your audience. You have to spend the time really understanding what's important for them, what's relevant for them. And if you understand that, I think everything you do will help you be more effective and efficient in your communication. The second thing I would say that's really important, besides really targeting your message to your specific audience, which means you might create multiple pitches. So you don't just have one generic pitch, you have a pitch yeah. that you tweak and adjust based on what you know about your audience. The second piece that's really important, a lot of us when we pitch, we really double down on data and facts. And data and facts are really important, no doubt. But emotion mm -hmm. matters too. If you can connect with people emotionally, if your product, your service, your offering has some emotional component to it, really mm -hmm. leaning into that and helping people have an emotional experience about it, getting them excited, getting them concerned, creating fear of missing out, that FOMO. If you can do that, you can be very motivational. The, the research is very clear. Relevance mm -hmm. is critical in an emotion and getting people to feel something is also very important. So we, can we try to take like a, an example or, or a product? I mean, you're saying let's do the research and understand who we're speaking with. And if we find a common ground or some important component, we can share it as part of our pitch. Certainly, yeah. I, I can share an example of a, of a company I advise and have helped with a, a pitch. Would that be okay? Yeah. Sure, of course. Excellent. So, and this is a company that I think might be valuable to all your listeners and viewers. Uh, it's a company called Poised, P-O-I-S-E-D.com. And what they do is they help people with their communication skills. And mm -hmm. it's, it's a plug-in, if you will, to a virtual tool like Zoom, Teams, Meet, et cetera. And as you communicate, it is tracking information about your fluency, how many ums and uhs you have, uh, are you engaging in your voice, et cetera? So their pitch to be persuasive, to get people to think about using it, uh, is really about relevance. And, and they start by saying, think back to a recent communication or meeting that you had that didn't go as well as you wanted to. What were the consequences for you? What would have happened if it would have gone better? Well, we have a tool that can help ensure that your next meeting goes much better than that meeting you thought about. It can help you buy and then they itemize some of the things that they do. Do you see how very quickly that relevance is connected? I have you envisioning something you just went through that didn't go well. That often makes us uncomfortable and motivates it hurts. us. The pain. So, that's yeah. right. That's right. So there's a pain, there's a need, but it's not a need in general. It's a need that you have based on something that you did. So it's very personal and very relevant. And it also invokes an emotion. But it's not yeah. enough, especially when you bring up a negative emotion or negative experience to just get people sitting in that. You need to actually show them that you have something that can help alleviate that negative emotion. And that's where the pitch comes in. So very simple example. I think many of your viewers and listeners not only would benefit from their product, but would benefit from structuring pitches to be influential in that way. 
start by putting people in the need. We, we often get so excited about our technology and services that we talk all about what they are rather than how it will help people or it will encourage people to do something different or better. So you're saying definitely focus on the need, make sure to talk about the, the emotional, if it's the, the pain in a way. Yes. And segue right. for the solution. Right, and paint a picture that can make things better so people can envision mm -hmm. what, what the future could look like with your product, with your service, what it means. With their life, how living the life with the product, fantastic. Right, and, and if you're talking to investors, life. then you also have to talk about the value that this will bring to the company and therefore to their investment. Uh, but that's yeah. the next step. First, talk about what, how it helps the users. Now, let's talk about what you just did, actually, about selling via Zoom. So today, you know, many of the sales in the first calls are via video calls, via Zoom, and not uh, about flying and meet uh, the person in person until it's really late in the process. So how do we ensure that we do come across at our best when selling, when communicating like that on a video call? Sure. So let me give you some just best practices and, and give you a, a little bit of advice. So first and foremost, how you show up matters a tremendous amount. So mm -hmm. you need to practice. Uh, you need to record yourself and watch it. As painful as it is, it can be very helpful. All of my Stanford MBA students who take my strategic communication class get digitally recorded multiple times and have to watch and review. It's a great way to do it. And, and Zoom and tools like that make it very easy to record yourself. What, what you're looking for are a few things. In terms of your physical presence, you're looking for making sure you fill half the screen. Notice how I, I, both of us are filling half the screen. Yeah. A lot of people sit really far away. We like to see people's faces. We read a lot of information on people's faces. And if you're sitting far away, it's hard to tell. Yeah. Similarly, you need to be well lit. Many people yeah. sit in the dark. It looks like they're part of the witness protection program <laughs> instead of instead of yeah. being part of the video. So fill half the screen, make mm -hmm. sure you're well lit, take your shoulder blades and pull them down so you look broader. A lot of us hunch or lean yeah. and it makes us look less mm -hmm. confident. Mm -hmm. Probably more important than all of that is you want to make sure you look at the camera as you're speaking. This is hard, there's a video of somebody, you yeah. wanna look at the video. Uh, you might have slides that you wanna keep track of, but if I look at the camera, it looks like I'm talking to you. And in many cultures, your culture, my culture, eye contact is really important to demonstrate confidence, to demonstrate connection. And so teaching yourself to look at the camera is absolutely important. If you do those simple steps, you will be seen as more confident and people will really want to engage with you more. And I have a bonus tip. Make sure your shirt matches with the other person's shirt. Hey, I'm that. just lucky I have a shirt that, that that's pressed and, <laughs> and you know, but yes, we it's a match yeah. with your with your the people you talk to. Always a also, good idea. Matt, earlier you talked about um, the different stakeholders and that each of them needs sometimes different messaging, right? Different people, different communication styles, different roles. And when it comes to working in a startup, you have different stakeholders from investors to board members to clients to peers to co-founders. And you have been talking much about um, the communication infrastructure that you can actually embed in your company cultures alongside with uh, uh, with platform like Slack or Monday.com. Could you share with our audience more about the benefits of creating such playbook for communication infrastructure and how to craft it within your organization? Yeah, so th thank you for that question. Uh, I am brought in often as a consultant to help when organizations have failed or not done a very good job setting up a communication infrastructure. And to me, a communication infrastructure isn't just the tools you use. That's an important part, but it, that's not enough. You have to have, there are three things involved, people, process, and, and technology in creating a, an effective communication infrastructure. So you need to be thinking about, for example, the tools you use. Are you using Slack? Are you using Zoom? And when and where do you use which? When do you text somebody versus calling somebody? There need to be specific rules around technology usage and expectations. You need to make sure that you have processes in place that support communication. How do you train people in your pitch? How do you validate that people are representing your company and your ideas well? 
So do you build into the performance review process, a discussion about people's communication skills? Do you have a, a procedure where at the end of every meeting, you dedicate a minute or two to talking about the quality of the communication, not necessarily what was said, but how was it said? Those are things that can really reinforce and build a confident and, and a supportive communication culture within an organization. And then finally, you have to, to bring people in who have communication as something that they, they either do well or are willing to work on. And, and you as leaders need to role play. You need to do some modeling, role modeling, et cetera, so that people see that communication is important. Reward people when communication is successful. Pull people aside when it's not. So to set up a communication culture and infrastructure within an organization is very, very difficult, but it pays dividends considerably, especially when you scale or you pivot or you merge. Uh, if you have a well-established communication culture and infrastructure, it helps you tremendously. So you're saying, first of all, put it, like talk about it, don't hide it. Absolutely. It it's not a necessary evil. It is. Yeah. Many yeah. people treat communication as a necessary evil. It's not. Yeah. It's a requirement. It's a foundational principle. Now you're also creating such communication infrastructures for your clients, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. As you said earlier, communication is something that we always need to learn and improve. So do you have any tips for our listeners? How can they constantly improve their communication and confidence when working, again, on their startups, in a global market, hybrid, Zoom, face-to-face? -face? I have several ideas for that. One, be open to improving it. Many of us, especially when we're insecure, get very defensive. So be open. Uh, seek out feedback opportunities. Seek out learning opportunities. Take courses, get coaching, read books, watch videos, join mm -hmm. Toastmasters. It's a global organization that helps people with communication. So take the time to do that. Listening into your, your show, listening into my podcast. These are all ways that people can make themselves available to that mm -hmm. information. Second, seek out help from others. Get mentors to give you feedback. Observe others' communication. See what works. Uh, learn from that. Now, you don't necessarily have to try to be like somebody else, but but see what works for them. And maybe you can incorporate some of what they do. So mm -hmm. it's really being open. It's having a mindset of growth and, and, and trying to help and, and enlisting others to help you get better at it. Communication is, a, is a, a lifelong sport. You have to continue to practice. You have to continue to strengthen the, the skills that you have. And adjust and adapt as necessary. So the, the, those are the ways that we get better. And if you're not able to get those resources yourself, ask others. If your management uh, isn't focused on this, encourage them to get focused on it. It will make a huge difference for them and for you. When we started this conversation, you said that uh, that you're still learning how to improve your communication. So if you can share one specific habit that you were able to, to get and that was very helpful in your life and business. I'll share two. Uh, one is I do a lot of reflection. Every evening, I, I dedicate a few minutes to just reflect on my communication for the day. And I look for two things, things that went well and things that I can work on. And mm -hmm. at the end of each week, I go back and I, I reflect on my reflections and I'm looking for patterns and I'm looking, is there something that's happening? Is it on days where I don't get a good night's sleep, my communication is worse? Or is it when I'm talking to people who have higher status and power than I do, that I have issues? And I look for those patterns and trends, and then I seek out ways to address them. So active reflection, very, very important. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing that I encourage people to do is when you enter into a communication situation, it is so true for so many of us that we doubt ourselves. We might feel imposter syndrome. We might say all these negative things to ourselves, like I should have prepared more, et cetera. So I, on a daily basis, or whenever I enter into a conversation, including this one, I think to myself, I have value to bring here. There's, there's some value I have to bring. So I put myself in a position of, of seeing what I am bringing as a positive, And I remind myself that I'm in service of the people that I'm talking to. So I'm here to add value to those I speak to. And that helps relax me and that helps me focus. So reflect. And remind yourself that you bring value to the conversations and communication that you have. 
Thank you so much for these tips. And I think they're so relevant because it's always important to remember our value and to remind ourselves that we are worth it, even though we said the wrong thing or things didn't work as we wanted. And I liked what you say as well about really reflecting every day. I think it takes a lot of consistency and make sure that you're really doing it and asking the hard questions for yourself. But I have no doubt that the benefit is amazing. So Matt, thank you so, so much. I really appreciate you taking the time to be with us. And if you would like to connect with Matt Abrahams, you can do it on LinkedIn and you should go to the website, nofreakingspeaking.com. And of course, listen to his uh, podcast, which also the link will be just next to this video, which is Think Fast, Talk Smart Podcast. Well, thank you for the opportunity. I've enjoyed our conversation. Uh, those interested in communication, you can get lots of value, I hope, from nofreakingspeaking.com and check out the podcast I host, Think Fast, Talk Smart. It's all about communication skills. So it's a lifelong sport. You need to start right now. Fantastic. So I want to thank you once again for joining us and sharing your great experience with us. And thank you for watching the Liron Glickman Show, the show that talks about the human factor in business and communication. I will see you next time. Thank you so much and take care.